Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation. We're taking a one-week break from our study in Philippians. It's a timely break uh, because we've been studying the person and work of Jesus, and Revelation is all about the person and work of Jesus and its effect for the church until he returns. We're going to look at the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5 this morning. Revelation 22, you can just turn to the back of your Bible, and it's there, the very last chapter, chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And as we read, as always, let's remember, this is God's Word. It is truth outside of us. It is truth regardless of our feelings about it. It is truth regardless of our upbringing, of our background, of our cultural surroundings, of our ethnicity, of our race. It is truth outside of us, given to us by God himself as our authority and our joy. And let's read it that way this morning. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. As many of you know, John Bunyan was a Christian preacher in the 1600s. He was imprisoned for his faith, and he faced a long and difficult path of suffering and faithfulness to his Lord. During his imprisonment, he wrote the Christian classic allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, about a man symbolically named Christian who travels from his home, the city of destruction, to the celestial city. Before Christian, in the allegory, can get very far away from the city of destruction, two neighbors come racing after him to try to persuade him to come back. Their names are pliable and obstinate. All the names in the allegory have spiritual meanings. Pliable and obstinate. And we're going to pick up the story when they are trying to persuade him to come back this morning. And I'll I'll paraphrase a bit uh, so that the language is modernized for us. Neighbors, Christian said. Why have you come? They said, to persuade you to go back with us. But he said, that can never be. You dwell in the city of destruction, the place also where I was born. And dying there sooner or later, you will sink lower than the grave into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Be content, good neighbors, and go along with me. What, said obstinate, and leave our friends and our comforts behind us? Yes, said Christian, because that which you shall forsake is not worth to be compared with a little of that which I am seeking to enjoy And if you will go along with me and hold it, you will fare as I will. For there where I go is enough and to spare. Come away and prove my words. Obstinate asked him, what are the things you seek since you leave all the world to find them? Christian said, I seek an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that will not fade away and is laid up in heaven and is safe there to be given at the time appointed on those that diligently seek it. Read it, if you will, in my book. The neighbors eventually went back to their city of destruction. They would not go with Christian. But Christian, with his eyes set 
firmly on that inheritance, continued on his journey until he reached it. For Christian and for John Bunyan, who endured much suffering as well for Jesus, the destination motivated the journey. The destination inspired the journey. Where he was going made all the difference in how he was getting there. If we wanted to put it in a theological term, we would say the Christian has his heart set on paradise with Jesus. The Christian has his heart set on paradise with Jesus, and that glorious destination makes all the difference in how you live on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and this year and next year and all the years in between now and when you, as a Christian, will see Jesus face to face. The destination inspires the journey. The Christian has their heart set on paradise with Jesus. And this paragraph, at the end of the book of Revelation, is meant to change your life tomorrow morning. It's meant to give you a picture of your future. It's meant to put this picture in front of your face so that your destination inspires your journey, your everyday stepping on this journey towards heaven. That's why this picture was written. This isn't just the National Geographic of the Bible uh, designed to let us know what other places in the universe look like, and here's a place called heaven, and we thought you might be curious to read about it. No, that's not the goal. The goal is to inspire you. It's to motivate you. It's to guard you and warn you and press you forward towards that great destination. It's to change your life. That's the goal of this picture. What I want to do this morning is is walk through this picture so we really understand it and feel its value, and then we'll make some application for different seasons and ways in which we might be experiencing the Christian life this morning. Let's walk through it first. The passage can be broken into two primary themes, two primary themes that John the Apostle uses to describe this great picture at the end of his book about the destination, the gift of life from God, that's theme number one, and then the gift of life with God, that's theme number two. Life from God and life with God. Those are the two themes that John uses to walk through. And he begins right away with showering us with symbolic images. If you've never read Revelation, let me give you a really important theological word. Revelation is called apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic. It's not an everyday word you use at Subway. Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic literature. To give a, in common terms, it means theology by picture. All right? In common terms, that's what it means. So Revelation is theology. It's communicating truth by picture, by symbols. So John's desire is, is not so much to describe uh, the throne room of God the way a modern scientist might describe uh, a certain area in Africa or a certain area in the Arctic, and it was so wide and so long, and this feet were thick of ice. He, he's not looking to describe this scientifically. He's, he's using symbols to describe it theologically. Here's the truth of heaven. And so he uses symbols, and he begins just piling them up to get across this theme, the gift of life from God. Let's begin looking at the symbols. The angel that is giving John the apostle this spiritual tour begins by showing him a river, and it's barely disguised as a symbol. It's called the water of life. It's the river of the water of life. It's bright as crystal, so it's not diluted or polluted in any way, and it's flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street. So we begin with this idea of a river that is the river of life. Symbolically, this river is able to bring endless life to all of those who partake of it. So it's a life-giving. It indicates the possibility of endless life provided to those who receive it. This river flows from a location. It flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. Now, throne, all the way back to Revelation 4, is consistently used as a symbol of God's absolute dominion and authority. 
And since this is written during the time of the Roman Empire, there are undertones uh, going on here that we may not appreciate. John is declaring there is a throne above every throne. There is a king above every king. There is a dominion that has dominion over every dominion. There is a throne in heaven, John has declared. And all of human history takes place under the orders of that throne. So the entire book, which we won't read this morning, has made it very clear the throne is making all the decisions. The throne is making sure that human history progresses according to God's plan. And so we get to Revelation 22, and it says there's a river of life flowing from the throne. Symbolically, this is saying God's absolute authority and dominion is providing an eternal life. God's absolute power is giving a a river, a symbol of abundance in the ancient Near East, an abundant source of life is coming from the one who has absolute power and dominion. That's where we are so far with the symbolism. This throne belongs to somebody. It's a throne of God and the Lamb, which John has made very clear in Revelation 4 and 5. It's God's throne... But on that throne sits a lamb. And if we had read the beginning of the book, we would know this lamb is John's symbolic word for describing Jesus. It's a sacred nickname, if you want to use that phrase. It's a sacred nickname for Jesus, and it has a meaning. It doesn't just mean that Jesus is weak and limited. He's described earlier as a lamb who looks like it was slain, but is now standing This is a symbol of Jesus' sacrificial death. That's why Jesus is called the Lamb. He's the Lamb because he died in place of sinners. For any Jew especially, reading this book, the Lamb reminded them of all of the sacrifices that Moses had articulated would be necessary for sinners to approach a holy God. Well, there is this ultimate lamb, this person who died in the place of sinners, who paid for their sins, who satisfied God's wrath for them, and this lamb named Jesus is now sitting on the throne of God, and from that throne, a river of life is flowing. You can feel the meaning that John is communicating through these powerful symbols. He keeps going. He says this river is flowing through the very middle of the city. The idea here is it's accessible from everywhere. No part of this city is cut off from access to this river of life. Not only that, but there is a very unusual kind of tree. There's a tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit in each month. And the leaves of this tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, again, you can feel very, very clearly, Revelation is not trying to describe an oak that somehow branches over the river and sinks roots on both sides. You don't try to picture this scientifically. This is symbolism. It's communicating this river feeds a tree of life. It's accessible to all in the city, and its fruit is perennial. That's the idea. There's no barren season for this tree. There's no season when its branches are withered and dry. There is, at every point of the year, there is always a fruit that can be enjoyed by God's people. So the image is of an abundance that is always available, that is always accessible, that never has a dry season, that is always given to people for their life, and it has the effect, notice this phrase, the leaves have this healing for the nations, it has the effect of reversing the effects of the fall. It has the effect of reversing all of the sickness and death and destruction that came about as a result of sin. That's the effect of this tree. This garden is a reversal of all that had taken place because of sin. And if you know the beginning of your Bible, you see that the beginning and the end have this delightful connection. Because in the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of life. But because of sin... Adam and Eve, and all of those who were represented by them, all of us, were barred from that tree of life. Because of sin, we were not allowed to live forever. The way I tell my children the story in Genesis, when we go through the story, I always try to emphasize, 
God says you must go out. Out. Away from the tree of life. Because of sin, you may not come near. You will not come near. Out, out, out go the sinners. All those who defy the God of life have no access to the tree of life. And so they have death, death, death. But now, now, in Revelation, there is a tree of life fed from God's absolute power, represented by a lamb who died for sinners that gives life, life, life to the nations. What John is de de describing and declaring is there is now endless life available to all those who will come to this lamb. To all those who belong to this lamb, there is now life, life, life. So that now God is saying, in, in, in. The gift of life from God. Life without death. Life without disease. Life that is not limited to one ethnic group. Life that is for the nations. Life that is even for those who have defied God because there is a lamb on that throne. The lamb who died for sinners. God has made eternal life available to all those who belong to his son, the lamb, who believe that his son died in their place, they do not need to experience the endless march towards death. Here, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you, you may be interested in church and you're sure you're here, you have a friend, but you're not a Christian. Here's what it says. The Bible says God offers eternal life without fail, without a barren season, to anyone who believes in Jesus, that Jesus died for their sin. Brothers and sisters, this is for you, the Christians, but it's also for you, the non-Christian, if you are here and you want to believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, there is endless life for you. There is endless life for you. There is life without fail. There is life without limit. There is life without any barring of access. There is life for you in Jesus because he died for your sin and he received the out, out, out of God so that you could come in, in, in to the life that God offers. Life from God. This destination should make all the difference in your journey. If you want to have life, 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 you must come to this lamb named Jesus Christ and receive his payment for your sins so that you can be in this picture. That's what Christian was trying to say to his neighbors. Come, Come to Jesus so that you can have this life and so that you can be in this picture. You can partake of those leaves of healing. You can eat of that fruit that never runs dry. You can drink of that river. You can see that throne. You can enjoy this eternal future. You can re-enter that special garden with the God whom you have offended. It's also for Christians. Christians to remember, this is our destination. This is our future. Life forever with God. This is the future that we head towards. This is the future that should be plastered into our imagination every Monday morning. When the boss calls and he reminds you of something that he forgot to tell you, you should be thinking about this future. When the doctor calls and he tells you something you never wanted to hear, this is your future. When you face that tempting struggle with your spouse or your child and you're not sure how it's going to end, you can remember this is your future. When you feel weak and weary and you're tempted by worldliness, you can remember this is your future. Life with God. Because you belong to the Lamb who gives life even to 
sinners. If we could put this in theological terms, it would be, come sinners, receive endless life from the lamb who died in your place. Come Christians, remember that endless life is given to you by the lamb who died in your place. Life from God. But that's not all that John describes. He also wants us to understand this life is not just the endless monotony of existence. It also has this incredible explosion of joy and hope of life with God. It's life from God, but it's also life with God. John describes this life beginning in verse 3. No longer will there be anything cursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This could be captioned by life with God. What is life with God like? For sinners to be close to God automatically results in a holy curse. That is the automatic necessity of God's holiness. You cannot approach God as a sinner and not be the recipient of his curse. But because the recipient of his curse is already there, standing before him, having fully absorbed that curse, God has no more curse to meet out because the one who received the curse is always there. And so there is no more curse, not because God forgot about it or overlooked it or decided to, to cast it away, but because the curse has already been delivered. The paid in full is standing there at the throne, and therefore there is no longer anything or anyone that is cursed. And not just the people. Not just the people. I think that's John's accent here is that the very existence of the world will no longer be the recipient of the curse of sin. All of the grief that we experience in this world is because of sin. Genesis 3 makes it very clear. God cursed the ground because of man's sin. Adam was not just an individual. He was a regent. He was a representative. What Adam did affected not only his descendants, but this world. The world that was under Adam's name would receive Adam's curse. But this world, this world is not under Adam's name. It is under Jesus' name. And Jesus has no curse left for him because he carried all of Adam's curse to the grave. So this is a little thick theology, but here's what it means in in real life terms. It means none of the brokenness caused by sin has any place in this city cannot have any place, has no right to have any place, cannot enter, is not allowed to enter, has no right to enter because this place is under the name of Jesus and under that name there is no curse. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. Now, when we, when we read the word worship, we tend to think of a stage and drums and guitar and, you know, things like that. And maybe that'll be there in heaven. I hope so, because I like that kind of music. But the people that read this would obviously not be thinking that way. That's not what jumps to their mind when they read the word worship. What jumps to their mind is priests in a temple. What jumps to their mind is the most honored and intimate access with God himself. The most privileged place of service, the closeness to God himself, the ability to be God's very own individual worshiper, close and ministering to him without being being pushed out or kept out because you're a Gentile or just an ordinary Jewish person. No, no, you, you get to be right there with God. As close as and as personal as possible. That's what it means by worship him. You will get to personally minister to him. 
You're not on the outer court. You're not on the outer rim. You are, are there with him. The absence of a curse means the presence of proximity to God. And John continues to make it abundantly clear. They shall see his face. This is the sight that no human is allowed to see, given to God's people through the finished work of his son. This is the unseeable sight made seeable because of Jesus. This is the unimaginable sight made visible because of Jesus. They will see his face. Life in heaven is not just a nicer, more comfortable version of life on earth. It's not just... Life without the need of ibuprofen, what a life that would be. It's not just life without bleeding or life without cancer or life without car wrecks or conflicts. It is all of those things, but more centrally, it is life seeing what we have always wanted to see. It is life seeing what we were made to see. Life seeing what every other desire is just the smallest taste of a deep hunger and longing built into the human reality. That we want to see something magnificent. We want to experience something out of our minds. We want to experience the overwhelming power and delight and beauty that shines through the face of Jesus Christ. And this, at the end of the Bible, God says, is what we will see. Why, why do you think that superhero movies have made billions of dollars over the last couple of decades? It's because of this. We want to see beyond. And so if we can't see beyond, we make up something and, and fake it so that it feels like we're seeing something beyond. It's not just about entertainment. It's about the deepest hunger and longing of the human heart. Why, why do you think people study and look for heroes in history? They want to see something. Why do you think we make up and kind of cover over the faults of former leaders? Because we really want to see something, and if we can't see it, we'll fake it. Why do you think little children look up to their daddies and say, my daddy can do anything? They want to see something. They want to see it. And if they believe in Jesus, they will. They will see his face. You have never seen anything close to his face. When I was in college, I lived in Colorado. And Colorado has some beautiful sights. And one of the things I enjoyed the most was sunsets over the mountains. I don't know what does this, but somehow um, you would see these cloud formations, and when the sun would set behind the mountains, the clouds would just be, I mean, incredible, just dazzlingly bright and huge, and you see the mountains, and just this, what, what a scene. It, it, was, it was breathtaking. It was overwhelming. It was this, this beautiful, beautiful vision. Well, around that same time, you remember, when cell phones still flipped open, remember that? <laughs> long, long time ago. When they still flipped open, you remember when you, would, you could take pictures on those cell phones? And, and they were lame, man. I mean, they were lame. You would take pictures, and it would, it would sort of remind you of what you had seen, right? You take pictures of people, and you think, I, I, guess, I guess that's my child. I mean, it was sort of close, right? It was like a fuzzy, small, miniaturized, blurry version of reality. Listen, everything you've ever seen is a flip phone camera. The most magnificent sight you've ever seen is a flip phone picture. What's the grandest, most glorious, most breathtaking sight you've ever seen? What you are actually seeing is a 2D flip phone blurry camera shot. What you will see is the reality. Life 
with God. In my opinion, this is a missing piece in a common, popular understanding of heaven. People think of heaven primarily in terms of endless life, and they're not wrong. They primarily think of heaven in terms of a better life, and they're not wrong. What they are not aware of is that this life is life seeing God. The destination inspires the journey. It inspires the journey. His name, John says, will be on their foreheads. <laughs> Symbolic way of declaring they will permanently belong to him. If you're stamped on the forehead, what's the first and most obvious thing about you? If his name is on my forehead, you know what the first and most obvious definitive thing about me is? I belong to him. That will be your defining identity forever. You belong to him. That lamb, I belong to him. Who are you? I belong to him. What do you do all day? I look at him. What's the most important thing about you? I worship him. What is the most defining, life-altering activity and identity that you have? Jesus Christ. His name on my forehead explicitly forever. I will see his face and his name will be on my forehead. That is the destination that should inspire this journey. Night will be no more. They won't need lamp or sun or any other kind of light. Why? Well, because all of those things are needed because we're not next to him. He's with us in spirit, but we don't see him in his unveiled glory. We see him by faith, but not by sight. When we see him by sight, the sun will seem incredibly unnecessary. Have you ever seen those, those little dollar flashlights you can buy at the dollar store? Can you imagine placing one of those flashlights next to the sun? That's what the sun will be like in heaven. I mean, who needs it? Because the son of sons is there. He will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Those who belong to the Son of God are like kings in heaven. To be the slave of Jesus is to reign in heaven. To be the servant of Jesus Christ is to be exalted in heaven. And again, the destination should inspire the journey because what is true there in sight is true now by faith. So we can say right now, you know what's most glorious right now? To see him by faith. You know what's most privileged right now? To belong to him. You know what's the most valuable thing about me right now? I serve him. To serve him even now is to be exalted in heaven. To be lowly right now is to be promoted in heaven. To be his right now is to be more glorious in heaven than any human ever has the right to hope to be. Life with God. The destination should inspire the journey. Let me give you two types of people that I think need to have a fresh look at this destination. Two types of people. First type of person, the wandering Christian. The wandering Christian. The wandering Christian has let their eye drift from his glory and is taking steps down a side road toward a very different attraction. In this world, we are surrounded by paths into dark woods that seem charming and interesting at first, but they draw us towards self-indulgence and self-promotion. Essentially, they are a woods full of mirrors 
inviting us to stare at ourselves all day long. They invite us to love the echo glories of this world rather than the great glories of Jesus Christ. They invite us to think about things like reputation and material comfort and relational ease and self-promotion and titles and fleshly indulgence. They draw us away from the path towards heaven and toward the woods of focusing on ourselves rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wandering Christian seeks to keep the path towards Zion in view, but to wander for a while in the woods that are all about ourselves. And every one of us has wandered or is wandering in some way in our lives. I wander towards my reputation when I think about myself in that last conversation. I wander towards the flesh when I browse or watch this or that show that probably isn't edifying my soul. I wander towards those woods when I focus on how I wish I could be better than I am. And I indulge in a little sandy bank called self-pity in those dark woods, and I think about myself over and over and over again. I wander. I wander through those woods, always keeping the road towards Zion in view, but effectively taking my eyes off of the king and toward these pathetic imitations of his glory. And this passage is like Jesus coming to the edge of that road and calling out and saying, come back to the road towards heaven. Come back from the woods of self-focus and self-promotion and self-comfort and indulgence and come back to the road towards heaven and fix your eyes on your destination. Fix your eyes on me. Come back from the woods that you are wandering. Come back from those mirrors where you stare at yourself. Come back from craving the flip phone and come to see the reality. Come to my word. Come to these sights that I've given you by faith. Come away from those self-focused mirrors and look at me and let me inspire this journey. Listen, we all wander. Aren't we wanderers prone to wander? Don't I feel it, the hymn says, prone to leave the God I love? Here's my heart. Take and seal it. For what? Seal it for thy courts above. Where are you wandering? Maybe not rejecting, maybe not denouncing or denying, just wandering wandering these whimsical woods that draw us away from the focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are the woods of this world calling to you, inviting you to make them your home? And how is this passage inviting you, me, to come back to the sight of heaven? The wandering Christian. Dennis Johnson says, the hallmark of the true bride is that she worships no one but God and waits for no bridegroom but the Lamb. Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Second category of application, the weary Christian. The weary Christian. The weary Christian wants to keep walking, but is fatigued. Their battle with sin, their battle with this world, their awareness of cultural temptations makes them weary. It makes me weary. It makes you weary sometimes. We're weary. We see difficulties in the church. We see the failures of Christians. We see infighting among the people of God. We see the the apparent power of the cultural structures that deny the Bible and denounce the faith. And we're weary. We are weary. We've been struggling. We've been fighting. We've been walking. But we're weary. This passage breathes strength, hope, into the weary Christian. 
If following the rules of godliness and the calling of church membership and the responsibility of evangelism and righteousness, of godly marriages, standing firm against the culture, loving your neighbors, if it seems more like a weight or like a duty, you need to acknowledge that honestly. You may feel weary of this Christian road. You need a sight of your destination. Too often, I think Christians walk the road with their eyes on the road rather than on the destination. That's a subtle difference. We want to grow in righteousness, so we focus exclusively on righteousness and on our failures. And it's well-intended. We want to keep growing. We want to keep fighting. And we have to glance down to see where we are failing. We have to be aware of our weakness. We have to repent of sin. We know we're supposed to love the unlovely in our family or in our neighborhood or in our world. And it's hard to love the unlovely and the unloving. It's hard to love them. They're not lovely and they're not loving. And so you're weary of loving these unlovely and unloving people. You're weary of doing that. You want to love them, but they are hard to love. And so you're weary. You try to look in yourself and do the Disney thing and find within your heart the reason to love these people. And you look in and you see mostly emptiness and disappointment. And you're not sure what Mickey meant all those years. And so you begin to ask, where where am I supposed to find this love toward these unlovely and unloving people? Your eyes need to be on your destination. It's a short walk that seems long. But it seems endless if your eyes are in the wrong place. It's a short walk that seems long, but it seems endless if your eyes are in the wrong place. If you are weary, spend some time by faith in this city. You'll find your strength returning. You'll find your hope returning. You'll remember that it's a short walk to a glorious destination. If you are weary, you need to have your eyes in the right place. Puritan pastor Octavius Winslow encompasses this way of thinking. The following long quote, but I think it's worth it. Let's read it together. Soon, he says, soon, soon. You will have done with the judgment of this poor world. With your head pressed upon a dying pillow and with eternity slowly rising upon your view, human opinion will weigh but little with you then. Oh, to meet the Savior as a loving disciple, as an obedient child, bearing the marks of the dying of the Lord Jesus, the scars and chafings of the crude and heavy, yet blessed cross born for him. It will then be of little moment, it won't matter, whether you ruled an empire or swept a crossing, wore a mitre or served the Savior in the most obscure and lowly sphere of his church. Found in Christ, standing complete in all the will of God, you will hear the plaudit and receive the welcome of your Lord and Master. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Weary Christian, this is your destination. Wife that is enduring the ongoing imperfections of your husband with love and kindness, this, this is your destination. Husband that is enduring the imperfections and ongoing struggles of your wife, this is your destination. Sick saint, experiencing the curse brought about by Adam's sin and ours, this is your destination. Weary father, praying and weeping for your long lost child, this is your destination. Where are you weary? Look at your home. You will be there soon. And he is there waiting for you. 
The destination inspires the journey. It makes all the difference tomorrow, Wednesday, Friday, in our ordinary vocations and everyday lives, when we're in traffic or we're going to sleep, when we're caring for the children or doing a job report, when we're figuring out the finances or we're reaching out to a neighbor, all of those ordinary activities are transformed by this vision of our future. This is where we are headed towards. When Christian finished that journey, Bunyan described it this way. I saw in my dream these two men went in at the gate, Christian and his friend, and as they entered, they were transfigured, and they had raiment put on that shone like gold. There were also those that met them with harps and crowns and gave to them the harps to praise within and the crowns in token of honor. And I heard in my dream that all the bells in the city rang again for joy. And it was said to them, enter into the joy of your Lord. Now just as the gates were opened to let in the men, I looked in after them. And behold, that city, the city shone like the sun. The streets were paved with gold, and in them walked many with crowns on their heads. This is our future, brothers and sisters. Let's pray.